What's up, everybody? I'm Ian Elliot Carter, and this is the Intellectual Controversy Podcast. morning um, we got you. <laughs> is that like because that's one of those things we've kind of talked about is like okay at what point is it not me just respecting a certain culture mm-hmm. versus me like taking that culture and trying to use it to my own ends right. like uh, one of the big, biggest examples for me is like I love reggae music like mm-hmm. I'll listen to Bob Marley all day long mm-hmm. um, and actually kind of joked around about like especially when I was in Atlanta like if someone if someone who's black listens to Bob Marley, you're embracing their culture. If I listen to Bob Marley, it's just because I like to smoke weed and get high, <laughs> which is it, not always, like, that's not always the truth. Uh, but I think about that because, one, I like the, the message that Bob Marley had about, like, through love, through unity, like, we can make a better world. Uh, and I think you get into the realm of cultural appropriation when it stops being about, like, okay, Let's take an example like like white kids that have dreadlocks. Mm-hmm. Like when it stops being, I just like dreadlocks and I want to I want to have dreadlocks because I think they're cool. Mm-hmm. To okay, I'm trying to use the fact that I have dreadlocks to get to this area, and I'm trying to use your culture to get me to where I want to be. Like mm-hmm. that to me is where it starts being a damaging thing, and you're you're manipulating someone else's lifestyle to for your own means. Mm-hmm. Your response. There is a difference between appreciation and appropriation. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's the topic of this, uh, this whole creation. This yeah. Yeah. work. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, and, and that was that was a quote that was given to me by um, that was get that actually was given to me within a 15, 20, 15 to twenty minute conversation that I had with Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. Mm-hmm. Um, like he literally like that was one of the things that we were talking about. Um, and that was the quote he gave. He's like, it's a difference between appreciation and appropriation. He was like, hip hop culture was was created with the help of blacks, Hispanics, and white individuals. Mm-hmm. They appreciated the street culture that we brought from the Bronx mm-hmm. and the other parts of New York, and they wanted to be a part. Yeah. The problem becomes when you don't you don't want to be a part. You want to take credit mm-hmm. for the culture that is mm-hmm. now on the forefront. Mm-hmm. The problem becomes when mainstream media wants to recognize Macklemore and Iggy Azalea mm-hmm. as the face of hip hop, as the mm-hmm. face of yeah. hip hop music. Okay, that's when it becomes an issue. Yeah. We're not saying that it's Macklemore and Iggy, Iggy Azalea's fault. Mm-hmm. Okay. What's being said is that you can't label them the face of hip hop when it's countless other individuals who has a real recognition recognition mm-hmm. of what the culture mm-hmm. as a whole mm-hmm. represents. Macklemore and. and I say this about Macklemore. Macklemore has a great representation of what the culture represents. You messing on my thrift shop now. <laughs> the problem in the, the problem in the issue becomes when Macklemore is looked at as the new face of what hip hop represents. So let's take that back to like what was it? He won Artist of the Year. Um, album. Album of the Year. Album of the year. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like low. exactly that's yeah. I guess my question there is like I feel like I feel like you and I are on the same page there like mm-hmm. like Malcolm Moore is a great hip hop artist like yeah. he, he like I like his music I like the way his, his words and it, like his lyrics and his beats flow together mm-hmm. but I'm with you in the fact that he he had only been out for like two three years at that time and you got all these other hip hop artists. That, that were making great albums. And I and I'll even did like i even give it one better and I'm not even saying this just because I'm a fan of you bro. Like I'm not even saying this just because I'm a fan of the guy. Uh-huh. Because it's countless other individuals that when it happened that year, mm-hmm. they was like, 
what the world was going on. Yeah. Like, Macklemore wins hip hop album of the year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Clearly, every publication, every hip hop critic, and every hip hop um, gatekeeper clearly stated, oh yeah, Good Kid Mad City is about to win hip hop is about to win hip hop album of the year. No question. Mm-hmm. And then the heist, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis. And we all recognize that 80 to 85% of the voters for the Academy of the Recording Arts and Sciences are Caucasian individuals. Yeah. So as soon as I get this ballot, I'm just recognizing the people that has been pushed down my throat yeah. by mainstream media. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Macklemore at their shop. Mm-hmm. It's all you was here about. Oh, yeah. I mean, from, May, from, May, from mainstream media. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's, let's check the heights and keep it moving. So where do you, like, in my mind, where do you draw the line between, um, where do you draw the line between appreciation and, and an appropriation? Yes. Like, in, in the in the case of Macklemore, like, yeah. obviously you said, like, he has an appreciation mm-hmm. for the... He has the an appreciation other. for the culture, but it becomes a problem when mainstream media starts to appropriate the culture and mm-hmm. decides that they want to give him credit for being the strongest voice does for he, the culture. Does he, as the artist, have the responsibility, and this is the question I'm asking, yep. does he, as, as the artist, have the responsibility to offset that? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Now, by make, okay, great example. Mm-hmm. Eminem won Hip Hop Album of the Year for um, the Marshall Mathis LP. Mm-hmm. Okay. He goes up on stage to accept the award and said, I want to thank all of those who helped pave the way for me to get where I am today. Those who are the strongest voices in the hip hop culture, such as Cool G Rap, Outkast, Jay-Z. Yeah. He started naming names. Mm-hmm. When you get up on stage and you decide that you want to take hip hop album of the year, knowing what comes with that, and the only thing that you do is go on Instagram and screenshot the text message that you sent Kendrick Lamar exactly. saying, hey man, mm-hmm. it should have been you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'll agree with you because I even felt some kind of way about that, that like, okay, you already won, you already won an award in a predominantly not white category. And then to it almost felt like to add insult to injury, you wrote out this text message, screenshot it, and put it on your Instagram, and put it out there for people. Almost like you're patting yourself on the back, like saying, "Hey, look, I'm going to take the award, but look, look what I'm doing." And so, um, yeah, and I, I'm I'm with you on that. Like I feel like that's a little bit of him. He may have an appreciation, but I feel like that was a little bit of him maybe using it to his means, like. Not having a true appreciation for for where he's at. I'm gonna flip the table completely over. So, mm-hmm. as we talked about Mike Vick mm-hmm. and what he said, it reminded me of Ben Carson what he said about poverty. Okay. Wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> you need to just be quiet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What if you know? I remember when this happened because what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, Macklemore had went through this whole thing to be independent. To, he wasn't gonna be anything. What if him staying on the stage and accepting that war was a culmination of all the hard work? And in that moment. He didn't think about that, but he thought about the journey it took to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I say that to say this, that just as, you know, we've talked about Kuhn and how we place these stigmas, like you talked about with mainstream media, most of those people don't even fit in the scene. Because what you're talking about with hip hop, mm-hmm. you know, we, you know, Ian and I, we, we talked Wednesday about, um, you know, Chance the Rapper and, and the people who were buying those tickets, they're white not black folks buying those tickets. So it's like people are quick to argue about this person needs to stamp their visa, stamp this car, instead of us trying to realize, okay, here's another person that's come into this. And, and you know, how can we all grow? Because the people who are making the votes, they don't match us. Mm-hmm. The white kids that you see that are actually listening to this music, they listen to crazier rap artists than I do. And they're paying for those shows. Mm-hmm. They don't fit that older narrative that has the votes. Mm-hmm. So as much as we may shift to, to, okay, well, it is appreciation, it is appropriation, 
maybe those people who are actually ingrained in the culture, maybe maybe they enjoy it as much as us. I give it to Eminem. He he knew the line he walked. You know, Mac Lamar, he's independent, he did it on his own. So it's it's a little like, I think sometimes we're quick to to jump into situations because of how we do feel, but not looking at it through sixty. Um, and y'all can debunk that. I, I was gonna say, let me say. add on to that because <laughs> you bring up a good point. Is like, okay, there's this culture that is driven by by young black men, mm -hmm. but the people that are driving that industry are generally young white kids. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, at what point? Or even, or even middle aged. White yeah. Men. Or yeah. even like, because I mean, again, like I remember when. <laughs> When Eminem won, I was 12, 13 years old. I'm 30 years old now. So that's the majority of my life, Eminem has been a rapper. Um, so how how does that fit in your mind in the narrative of like, okay, do we, like he said, do we, do we stay to this narrative that hip hop is a black driven industry? Mm -hmm. Or do you, do you adapt and grow to the fact that, okay, while the majority of the artists may be young black men, the people that are, are paying for the albums and paying for the shows and stuff are white kids, so... We we stay to the narrative of it not being a black-driven industry, but a culture-driven industry. Okay. Um, prime example, um, when Def Jam Records was initially started back in 83, 84, mm -hmm. it was started by Russell Simmons and Rick Rubin. Yeah. Rick Rubin, for the most part, up until he met Russell Simmons, was a rock guy. Mm -hmm. He embraced yeah. the culture. Mm -hmm. He knew his he knew the place mm -hmm. that he had in the culture, okay. and so he wanted to bring a fresher, more mm -hmm. um, harder hitting sound mm -hmm. to the culture. Because before, beforehand, the culture was driven more so by um, disco-based samples. Yeah. He wanted to bring a much more hard-hitting sound mm -hmm. to the culture. I gotcha. Um, Def Jam gets started. It's becoming success. One of the interns who eventually grows to become CEO of Def Jam Records is Leo Coleman, mm -hmm. Jewish kid. Mm -hmm. Where did he rises to the ascension in the within the culture is by bringing them the Beastie Boys. I got you. Three white kids from New York who had an appreciation for the culture. Um, you have to have an appreciation for the culture. It doesn't really matter what color you are. Mm -hmm. You have to have an appreciation for the culture and not an appreciation for what you can get. Mm -hmm from the culture, mm -hmm. because that's, that's when it becomes a problem, and that's when it becomes an issue. Well, and just, this is something for, more so for, like, people that'll watch this video, mm -hmm. um, because you keep saying, like, the culture, the culture, the culture. Mm -hmm. Explain for people that maybe don't understand, like, I know a bunch of white kids that are like, man, I love Eminem, I love Jay-Z, because the beats hit, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Explain, like, the culture of hip-hop to people that were either not raised around that or don't understand like what what that means to, to be what the culture of hip hop is. Um, hip hop is a culture that started with started in seventy six seventy seven um, by three major three major components three major individuals DJ Cool Herc mm -hmm. in the Bronx on Sedgwick and Cedar corner Sedgwick and Cedar. Um, African Bambada and Grandmaster Flash. Those three are credited with being the individuals who ignited this culture. The culture consists of five elements. MCN, DJing, which was actually the first element that was created within the culture. So DJing, MCN, graffiti, breakdancing or b-boying, and um, knowledge of self and knowledge of the culture. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, newer individuals that consider themselves rappers or rap artists, mm -hmm. they don't even have an appreciation for the culture, mm -hmm. and that's not. And that's Glad not you went there because that's yeah. what I was going to go next. And that's not even speaking on those with those without a darker melanated tone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's individuals that's black yeah. that don't have an appreciation for the culture. Exactly. They just have an appreciation for what they can get out of it. 
Well, and I think a, a, a prime example of that is because like Lil Yachty went on record and said like talking about like the mumble rap and versus like hip hop, and, mm -hmm. and he he said pretty straightforward that he doesn't really care about the history. He just cares about making his music the way he wants to make his music. Money. Exactly. Mm -hmm. oh. To to say um, you know, and then, and then we'll wrap this up. But I want to leave you with this: Do you believe that hip hop can influence the fight on racism? Yes, definitely. Um, in order to do so, it has to get back to a place where um, where the culture is one, the culture is appreciated, mm -hmm. and two, the voice that we have. Mm -hmm as people within the culture um, is appreciated. Um, once again, this is, uh, I use myself as a prime, a prime example. 15 years old, I'm in Atlanta for Christmas holidays. And I'm in Shannon Mall walking out of Camelot. I'm in Camelot and I noticed this guy over on the side reading Billboard magazine. Like, okay, nah, that's not him. So I walk out, I get the Great American Cookie Factory, mm -hmm. and the same guy standing there trying to buy some cookies. I looked over at him, I said, yo, you know, you look just like, he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm Chuck D. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. And so that turned into a 10, 15 minute conversation of understanding the voice that you have mm -hmm. within the culture and how powerful it is to create social change Absolutely. within your community, which is the basis of the EP that I'm um, yeah. dropping on the 21st of August, which is the greatest weapon, of okay. realizing that your voice is the greatest weapon yeah. in combating social change and combating the ills within your own mind as well. Um, okay. And, you know, just to do a quick little shout out, I really, really appreciate the episode that you all did on mental health. Yeah. That was awesome. We appreciate it. And the intellectual controversy. <laughs> it's what we do.